Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that in whatever condition we find ourselves this morning, we can turn to you. We can open our hearts and our minds to you. And you in your mercy and in your great love and forgiveness receive us. Draw us, therefore, near to you. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence. And we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know what condition you arrived here this morning, but I know on any given Sunday, all kinds of people here show up for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes they're here because they're spiritually hungry, and they're hoping somehow, some way, that whether it be a word that's heard in the sermon, or a lyric in one of the hymns, the piece of the liturgy, or some kind of an experience they hope they might have in the receiving of communion, there might be in their lives some kind of breakthrough. That there is this enigmatic longing, and they're hoping perhaps, perhaps, that might be met here. There are other people here because it's their routine. They're glad to be here. They're here most times, and of course they can't imagine being anywhere else at this point on Sunday morning, except right here at 338 East Lyman Avenue. There are other people who are here strictly as a favor to someone, especially on Mother's Day. They don't really want to be here to tell you the truth, but because they want to please their mother. They've said yes. You can spot them, you know. They're, they're, they're like this. And no matter what's going on in the liturgy, no matter what hymn is being spoken, they are absolutely stoic. And this for them is an act of endurance. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming in. It is Mother's Day, and I must tell you how grateful I am, uh, not only for my own mother, who is still alive in her 90th year, but also for my wife, who is the mother of our five sons, um, two of whom are here with us this morning. Um, it has never been for her an easy task. Uh, when we lived actually not very far from here, up on Phelps Avenue, I went down to Park Avenue to one of those gift shops where they want you to spend money on things you don't need. And, um, but I found a, a t-shirt, an applicant across the front, it had military medals. And underneath the military medals it said, Major Mom loved by all her troops. Um, that's still true. Happy Mother's Day, Laura Lee. And to the rest of you, we salute you. This is a kind of odd Sunday, in a way. It's odd only because we have been going headlong since Easter Sunday with very triumphal stories of the resurrection of Jesus beating everyone else's expectations, leaving them in the dust, showing up in the flesh, doing everything from eating fish to appearing behind closed doors to doing all sorts of things that nobody ever would have expected Jesus to have done because he died. And yet <laughs> death could not hold him as we have sung. And that's exactly true for Jesus. And then now, here we are, still in the Easter season, and we start talking about a different kind of theme. And that is the theme of Jesus, not as triumphal, resurrected victor from the dead, who has defeated death and Satan and all of the forces of hell, but instead we have this very tender picture of Jesus as who? The, the good shepherd. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember going to church as a kid and not being able to relate to the pictures I saw of Jesus as a good shepherd at all. You know, it's, you've seen them in stained glass windows and things where you have Jesus and he has this very beatific look on his face. He's got a lamb around his shoulders. The lamb is absolutely lily white, spotless, clean. There is not a mark on Jesus' garment. In fact, even his fingernails were clean, cleaner than probably mine are now. And I thought, I mean, there was nothing in my suburban world that could relate to that at all. And it only got worse when I actually came in contact with real sheep and real lambs. Who want not, they don't want to be carried on anyone's shoulders to save their life. They kick off, they don't like it, they run the other way. Larley and I had this very unfortunate indication where we had a lamb that we had borrowed as a prop, actually, because I was going to act out St. Francis for the Feast of All Saints. 
at our church where we were serving. And the lamb took off like a rocket around our yard. We are diving into the grass to catch this lamb. Jesus, what artist would paint you looking like that? And yet, there is something both about that picture as agriculturally inaccurate as it might be. And that touches us. And it's captured, you see, in the collect. Would you turn with me, please? Once all of us finish the processional hymn to the opening acclamation, here's the theme. As you know, collects are in fact meant, although they don't always do this, they're meant to set a tone and hold up a theme that gets carried through the lessons. That's really the point. And this one does that, and does so with a tremendous amount of force. Because we're praying that this, this Jesus, whose son Jesus, is what? The good shepherd of your people. Grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls each by name and follow where he leads. I almost don't know what to do with that. The reason is because it invites me to pay attention to things that are going on in my heart that I'm not sure I want to notice. You see, in the midst of the society and the culture in which we live, where everything is about getting the next good thing done, I mean, it's about accomplishments, isn't it? it what people want to say to us is, we said it to our kids when they did things like clean their plate or made up their bed. Good job. Good job. And, and that's the message that literally goes through our whole lives, is that what gives your life purpose, what gives your life, in fact, count, what allows it to count, is that you've done what? You've accomplished. You've done a good job. Whether it was getting into the right college, whether it was making a certain set of grades, whether it was getting the next promotion on your job, whether it was finding your way into a career that gave you meaning and success, whether it was an accumulation of money, whether it was about being able to do some things at parties that cause people to like you, want to have you back, you knew how to carry on a conversation. Maybe you could mix a good drink or even juggle a little bit. You were fun and therefore people wanted to be around you. It was the accumulation, you see, of skills. Yes. And it was those skills that in fact allowed other people to think well of you and more importantly, and in fact more tragically, to allow you to think well of yourself. So that who you define yourself to be is, in fact, someone who can provide, whether it be on a resume or a CV, or to casually drop something in a conversation that causes people to notice that you can do things, that you have done things, and that there are, in fact, better things ahead. That's the kind of people many of us want to be. That's the model that's held up for us. But you see what that does not do. And what this collect invites us to notice is that it in fact does not answer the cry that is inside of us to be, whether that be in relationships with people, much less to be in relationship with a God who in fact cares, regardless of the list of accomplishments, before whom we in fact have to prove nothing who in fact in the midst of this extraordinarily complex universe actually knows us, notice, notices us, and invites us into the kind of relationship with him that is based on not our accomplishments, but rather based on his care. I, I must confess to you, especially as a kid, I didn't know a lot about that kind of God. In, in fact, what I did, and I think it's true for many of us, is that we actually superimposed on God, not the picture of the Good Shepherd, but rather the picture of the one who has the same level of expectations as everybody else. So if God's actually going to like me or pay attention to me, that means I have to do things well for him too. The problem is, is that he knows things about me I wish nobody else knew. And that means that there may be something inside of me that will never, ever be considered pleasing in his sight. So where does that leave me, huh? Especially if I want God to answer my prayers. God looking at him and saying, oh, I don't think so. And how does that 
square with Jesus as a good shepherd who invites us into the kind of intimacy that we can hear his voice. Hear his voice. People who hear voices of Christ <clears throat> and knows him who calls us each by name, who not only knows that I'm Gregory Warren Brewer, but knows the impact of what all of that collection of syllables and alphabet mean to me when I hear that name spoken. It's an extraordinary invitation into a level of intimacy that most of us, quite honestly, do not know about God. And yet, that's exactly the picture that Jesus paints. That he calls himself a good shepherd. In other words, not a stand-in, a higher hand, much less a thief. But instead, invites us into that relationship with him, where he is the one who, in fact, knows us, who does call us by name, who knows the intimate details of our lives, more importantly, who actually knows the tracks and the geography of our own human heart, and not only knows it, but calls us into closeness in all of what, in fact, is inside of us. Because if Jesus is the good shepherd and calls us sheep, which for some is not a very big compliment, I have to say to you, but instead, yeah, what it says something to me about this is the fact that, that the relationship is more important than the task. Sheep don't know a lot about tasks. They know about eating. They know about following the voice of their shepherd. They know about, in essence, the next meal. Not much else. Sheep are not high on the intelligence part. And yet, what that says to me about Jesus is that for him, the relationship is more important, far more important than the tasks. And that, and that what he is not asking of me is to somehow think about him as the great judge of the sky who is continuing to look to see what I'm doing and what I'm not and orders and orders his opinions of me accordingly. That's not a good shepherd. Believe me, if a shepherd did that with sheep, the shepherd would quit the first day. Instead, he invites us into something that's far, far deeper. And there is inside of many of us a longing, a hope, and a desire that I might somehow discover a place of being understood and of meaning that is far larger, far deeper, and far more powerful than merely being rewarded or punished based on accomplishments. I have to ask, do you know that about God? Do you know Him as one who receives you and who cares so much more about you that he, in fact, just wants to be with you. I know that sounds kind of strange. The God of heaven and earth, who has made everything that there is, who literally spins planets into their courses, what? Wants to be with me? Everything about our understanding about humanity, the role humanity plays in the universe, even the way we operate and move together in society, mitigates that in understanding of, against that understanding of God entirely. We feel more than ever the sense that we are only our accomplishments. We're the machine, a part of the big machine. We're making things moving, and the call is to be productive. That God, in fact, loves me, and that somehow wants to be with me, regardless of where I am on my resume, my career path, where I am in my relationships, or the lack thereof. Absolutely. And what it takes, family of God, is to do, the, I think, the most courageous thing of all. And that is to pay attention to your own longings. To pay attention to your own longings. And put those longings, whether you can articulate them or not, before God and say, 
Here's who I really am. Here's who I really am. And offer that person to Him. It is in that moment that allows you to be able to face the very worst that life has to offer. I mean, did you read the epistle lesson? It's all about persecution, about unjust suffering. And there's nothing in it about somehow you being rescued out of that at all. Just the opposite. It's the ability to face that kind of suffering with a level of poise and courage. Because you know that God is not abandoning you in the midst of that kind of suffering. Just the opposite. He is literally undergirding you and freeing you from sin, even in the midst of the worst that life brings our way. That's courage. That's great poise. That's the work of the fruit of the Spirit of God in the very depths of your soul. We are not naive. We don't run away from life. No. Christians serve a one who died on a cross. And therefore, we can walk with great dignity and grace, even in the midst of places of profound suffering. It is no accident. That even today, in the hot spots around this planet, more often than not, the men and women who are on the ground, serving those who are in need, who don't need the camera newsmen in front of them, but are giving themselves without a reservation, are Christians. Because they're not afraid. And they don't need the limelight. They're just there to serve. Whether we're talking about the Ukraine, whether we're talking about the next natural disaster, you fill in the blank, whatever the turmoil spot is on this planet, almost always there are Christians who are mobilizing other people to go there and show up. That's what knowing the good shepherd can do. Because even in the midst of the worst, there are still places that he provides for us that really do fit the description inside of the still waters, the peace, the green pasture. The sense of being loved and cared for, in the, even in the midst of the horror of human need. Do you know him like that? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you be courageous enough to pay attention to your own longings? And allow that to be presented before God, not out of fear, but instead out of hope. That God, in fact, might be for you the God that he says he is. The one we see in Jesus, our good shepherd, who knows us by name and calls us to be his own.